So we're here to see Alex, so I really appreciate him coming and talking to us about convolution and hopefully we'll all learn more about it. But uh, without further ado, Alex Case. Thanks, Tom. <laughs> Thanks very much for coming. Um, can you hear me okay? How do I ask this? Raise your hand if you can't hear me. <laughs> so it must be working. Excellent. There's, <laughs> uh, I wasn't ready for that. Uh, if, if you're having trouble hearing me, uh, please make this sort of gesture that tells me you can't hear me so that you have a fighting chance of hearing what's going on. Um, this talk is like a lot of things that I've done in my life, which is um, with the exception of my fear of heights, which I can't seem to cure, when I see things that I don't understand or that I'm puzzled by or most arousing for me, bad choice of words, or most troubling for me uh, is if I see things that are overly hyped in the audio business. I seek out to understand them and separate the hype from the reality and figure out how they work. So convolution is, is an example for me of something that uh, when it first came out was a little puzzling. What's it for? It seems to be a cure-all. It seems to be miraculous. How does it work? And you can, if you're a digital signal processing engineer, this is, you should have another brownie and then leave shortly. This, is, this will be stuff that happens in the first couple chapters of a book by Oppenheim and Schaefer, a book called Signals and Systems. This is really the intended audience tonight is the recording engineer who doesn't necessarily have intimate uh, knowledge of how we build plugins, of how we write code in digital signal processing. But if we're going to use a, rever a reverb or any other device that's built on convolution, I think we could understand the basics of this algorithm and how it works. And in so doing, it gives us a better sense of what its creative possibilities are, but also what its limitations are so that we can separate the fact from the fiction. Uh, so, so that's what motivated me to get into this as much as I have. And so here's the set list for tonight. I, I first want to take a look at non-convolution reverb, just so we can reorient ourselves. You know, before reverb was convolution, how was it working? So we're going to run quickly through reverberators that don't convolve. Then we'll define convolution, and I'll try not to let you fall asleep, but I make no commitments. There, there are caffeine beverages there, however, so you can defend yourself. And then I want to make sure we understand the constraints that convolution places on us if we're going to use it correctly, and then run through some of the opportunities. So we'll start with non-convolution reverb. We'll go through this as quickly or as slowly as you like. Re Reverb's been around for a long time. If you're recording on location in the Music Verein Hall in Vienna, your reverb patch is the hall, and you mic the hall accordingly. Acoustic reverb gets into pop music, into multi-track recordings also if we go to the trouble to set up a reverb chamber. Another great pet project of mine is to understand reverb chambers from the history of recorded music because a lot of those spaces are becoming condos and, and coffee shops. So we wanna, I want to know as much about reverb chambers as possible. And we can build reverb chambers and, and create pretty interesting sounding reverbs very quickly. And basically any small but highly sound reflective space a bathroom, a kitchen is a good candidate. A basement full of concrete, those are all good candidates for a reverb chamber. And then, of course, we've had mechanical devices that are reverb. Many, I see some younger students here, you may think of a plate reverb as a patch on a digital one rack space unit, but it is born from a plate of metal. It was a mechanical thing that resonated that was good enough for rock and roll in many ways. In Springs, uh, there is uh, at least one person here who's actually building and selling spring reverbs. So you might want to hang out afterwards uh, because here he is. And where is he? There he is, in the back row. Raise your hand higher. Mechanical reverbs uh, matter still in this day and age. Spring reverbs still exist. Um, so let's make sure we understand at least briefly how those work. And then there are digital reverbs that aren't convolution. So those reverbs that say TC Electronic or Lexicon or Yamaha or Sony but that aren't convolution reverbs, how did those work? So we'll, we'll run through these technologies as much as you can stomach. So reverb from a small volume, you know, Wallace Clement Sabine, who helped Boston Symphony Hall open so successfully in 1900, did some basic research in Cambridge, so really nearby, that led to ultimately what we call the Sabine equation, which basically says reverbs directly proportional to the cubic volume of the space and inversely proportional to the subtle to the total sound absorption in the space. And so we can work that equation. If we, if we don't act, have access to a huge cubic volume of space, Boston Symphony Hall is over 600,000 cubic feet, a space you know, 30 times the volume of this space. What we might lack in cubic volume 
we can make up for in sound reflectivity. So when you're near a space that's tiled or concrete or made of steel or some sound reflective space, I don't know what you're doing in a steel room, but if you're in such a space, those might be candidates for creating reverberation acoustically, and it's a relatively fun process. You, all you need to do is put a loudspeaker in the room, and if it's stereo, put a couple of microphones in the room, move them around until it sounds good, and it's the subject for another entire lecture, how to more, predict, more predictably make it sound good. But reverberant spaces found in basements and bathrooms and kitchens and stairwells uh, are often really wonderful. And to be clear, Avatar Chamber 1 to this day still is used, and it's a six-story fire stairwell made almost entirely of concrete and steel, very sound reflective. It's got a couple of small diaphragm cardioid condensers and a pair of loudspeakers, and that's one of the most heard reverbs still to this day. In fact, here are a few pictures of some chamber reverbs. On the upper right, this is Avatar Chamber 1. It's just, I'll just show you a few quick shots with the microphones placed about midway up that six-story stairwell. On the upper left, the other chamber worth noting here, that's in Bob Clearmountain's studio mixed this, and there used to be a wine cellar in his basement, and he took it out and put in two small chambers. And it's difficult to understand scale. This is a tiny, this is a tiny door that couples to another chamber that's a similar size. So to keep his assistant engineers busy, he can couple the two chambers to each other by variable uh, amounts by opening and closing those doors. Those are tiny, you know, being John Malkovich doors. Those aren't regular sized doors. So they're pretty small chambers. That's my garage. Um, a spring will resonate. It's a mechanically resonant system. So if we could persuade our audio to make a spring or a network of springs vibrate, and if we can then grab that wave that's rattling around in the springs and bring it back into the mixing console, we have resonance driven by our audio that might sound good in some cases. And spring reverbs, maybe the highest art form of spring reverbs before plates and digital reverb, maybe the highest accomplishment was the AKG BX20. I've never had the luxury of living with these for very long, but it's not a single spring. It's not three or four springs like you might find in the reverb tank of a guitar amp. It's a vast labyrinth of interconnected springs. And an interesting thing happens whenever, whenever that that bending wave goes through the spring, you might think when it, eats, when it reaches the end of the spring, it'll just bounce back, not unlike sound bouncing back between two walls. And that's true, but if the, if, if the spring encounters another spring that's of a slightly different you know, springiness, then some of that wave continues into the next spring, but some of it reflects back. And so by having different springs of different sizes and different metals and different spring constants, and putting deliberately, putting kinks in the spring, these are patented, deformities in the spring. The whole idea of that is that when the wave goes through the spring, that discontinuity, that impedance change forces some of the sound to bounce back and some of it to continue on its merry way. And so you don't end up with a single dimension back and forth vibration like a flutter echo between two parallel walls. Just using a, a, a labyrinth of springs, you can build up a fairly complicated kind of mechanical resonance. And they, they pushed very hard to make, that, to make that sound good. And to be clear, a spring reverb never sounds like a symphony hall, but it is resonant and it can be flattering to sounds, especially if you're into surf music. <laughs> a plate reverb for those of you who might have thought it was a patch. I know a lot of you own some of these. If you're not using it, please donate it to the University of Massachusetts Lowell. <laughs> we want to clamp on a few more transducers and make it a surround plate. And We'll shoot impulse responses, and you can have all the convolution versions of your plate you want, and a plaque. It's okay. End of. End of. <laughs> so a plate reverb is literally a plate of steel. You know, it's about four feet by eight feet. It's hard to believe, but it's a, it's a mechanically resonant system. And instead of being kind of one-dimensional, like a spring would be, where something vibrates back and forth through a spring, it becomes two-dimensional. When the bending wave hits the edge of a plate, it bounces back into the plate. And so it's, it's sort of like a room, but it's a room of two dimensions. It has no vertical height, but it has length and width. So maybe it sounds a little bit more like a symphony hall, but in truth, of course, it doesn't sound anything like a symphony hall. If you ask anyone in this room over 35, they'll say, you know, it sounds like a plate. It's a different patch, a different sound. We do different things with it from a production point of view. There are some seats on the other side, on, you know, on the what we call the non-cookie side of the room. You guys shouldn't be shy when you've loaded up on sugars. Come on across. Right I appreciate you being so polite, but let's stop being polite. 
Cool. And it's hard to believe, but there was a time when someone said, hey, look, I've got a new plate. It's even smaller. Look, it's only six feet by three and a half feet. These things weren't measured in rack spaces. They were meant to be in closets. Now we have, of course, a single half rack space that's got 300 reverb presets. But the idea is, is it's a mechanically resonant system. That's a good idea, perhaps, for creating reverb in your production. Well, then there are digital reverbs. We're trying to get to convolution, but I just want to go quickly through digital reverbs, which you may be familiar with. The TC6000, this is probably the most heard reverb still in this day and age. The Lex 40L was the dominant reverb for over a decade. You've heard that reverb if you've been listening to recorded music from the 80s and 90s. I guess it's mainly from the late 80s and into the 90s, and their update on that, the 960L. How do these reverbs work? Well, they're digitally resonant. You can have a digital algorithm that resonates, you know, like a spring, only more so, like a plate, only more so. I mean, if you think about sound within a space, let's oversimplify sound within a space. We know that there's a sound source and a sound receiver, so the intent of S is its source, and the intent of R is that it's a sound receiver. And when sound plays in a space, you hear the direct sound first, sure, but then the sound goes bouncing around, and what we end up hearing, we know that we hear the reverb after the direct sound, and uh, I get bored in PowerPoint sometimes. It's fair, to say that, it's fair to say that reverb's nothing but a whole bunch of delays. All these reflections arrive later than the original sound. They're attenuated because they've traveled farther, um, and they arrive later. So it's, you could imagine that a digital reverb would be as simple as you take a signal, and then you create some number of delayed versions of it to simulate the reflections. So if you have a bunch of delay lines, and you tune them to the exact pattern of delays necessary, you, couldn't you simulate Boston Symphony Hall? It's, that's not flawed logic. It's almost impossible to really do, but the, the approach, the philosophy, is completely valid. The question might be, how many delay lines do you need to <coughs> digitally simulate reverb? Proving that I need you to donate gear, here's four delays that we have at UMass Lowell. <laughs> I spared you the picture of the Effectron Junior, but that's what's right below, for those of you who remember. I think it had eight, eight kilobits of memory eight kilobits. You haven't heard the word kilobits in 10 years, have you? Anyway, so you might ask the question, how many delays do you need to simulate reverb? It's a very good question. Well, wouldn't a single delay lead to comb filtering? You're familiar with comb filtering? If, if you have a signal and a similar signal just delayed a little bit, you know that delay time, if it happens to equal half a cycle, will cause that frequency to cancel or be massively attenuated. And for those frequencies for whom the delay time equals a whole cycle, then the delayed version arrives perfectly in phase with the undelayed version, adding up the signals, causing a doubling in amplitude. So if you're suspicious, you know, if I add delays to simulate reverb, <coughs> isn't this just a big comb filterizer? You're good to be suspicious of that. Let's make sure we understand, at least the, as much as you're willing to go along for the ride, I can tell by your expressions when you're done with these equations, but I'm gonna go with it for a little bit. <laughs> so I have a sound source and a sound receiver, and let's say that this room only has a single reflection. If I have some signal, X of T, that just changes over time, it's amplitude over time, it's Stevie Ray Vaughan's little wing playing over time. If I play that, and you're the sound receiver and you're hearing the signal directly from the speaker and a single reflection. And we'll imagine for now that the speaker's perfectly omnidirectional and this reflector's a perfect reflector and so there's just a little bit of attenuation. Then I can say that the signal you receive could be explained by some factors. G will be the relative level, again, the relative level of the delayed signal compared to the direct signal. So if we say that the delayed signal is exactly as loud as the undelayed signal, if it's the exact same amplitude, then we'd let G equal one. And if we say, well, it's gonna get a little bit quieter because it traveled a little bit farther, then we let G equal a, a fraction less than one. So G is the relative level of the reflection, the single reflection compared to the direct sound. And capital D is the delay time. It's the delay time difference between when the direct sound reaches your ear and the reflected sound reaches your ear. Well, this math maybe is a little bit of an acquired skill, but we can convert the signal processing into simple algebra. So the signal we receive is the direct signal plus a scaled and delayed version of that same signal. You hear little wing and you hear a quieter version. Well, your ears are presented with the waveform associated with a quieter and delayed little wing. And if we take the Fourier transform of that, so you know, Fourier transform means make the Y a capital Y, 
and you know, change time into frequency <laughs> omega. Don't, don't sweat this if you're not studying signal processing, but just trust me, and many people in this room uh, don't need to trust me. They are familiar with this kind of signal processing math. If you take the Fourier transform of this, which is to say, what is the frequency implication of what we've just done in the time domain, it becomes a fairly simple algebraic thing to solve for the magnitude of the frequency response. And if I solve for that, if you follow the algebra of that, having taken the Fourier transform, you end up with this term. And you don't need to derive that term, but it might be worth staring at this term uh, at least a little bit longer. And remember, there are cookies and brownies to help you through this if, if you're getting a little annoyed. So the magnitude of the frequency response is the square root of a one plus a two cosine thing. We can actually figure out what's going on in this equation without doing too much <coughs> trigonometry. If you also, like me, had Mr. Friesen for trigonometry, you may not have warm and fuzzy feelings about it, but none of you had Mr. Friesen, did you, for trig? Seems <laughs> unlikely. Where was he? Yeah, so this was in West Texas a few, oh, just a few years ago. <laughs> None of you look familiar. You had a geometry teacher, though. Are there reflections there? There are reflections in West Texas. They just, they twang a little. Um, so let's, let's simplify this equation a little bit so we can do something in our math. Let's let g equal 1. For now, let's say that the reflected signal is the exact same amplitude as the direct signal. So let g equal 1, that collapses this equation into something a little bit simpler. It's 1 plus 2 times the cosine of some term plus g squared. If g is 1, 1 squared is, man, you guys are good. 1 squared is 1. So do you remember the cosine function? It's a function that goes back and forth between 0 and 1 and also negative 1. So it oscillates back and forth between negative 1 and 1. We can, we can now totally conquer this square root thing. If, if we let cosine, whatever's going on, omega times a time, a delay time version, whatever's going on in there, as we vary frequency, it's going to be a cosine function that, that goes from 1 to negative 1, back through 0 to 1, back through 0 to negative 1, tracing out that perfect special pattern known as a cosine. Well, that means we have 1 plus 2 times 1, or 2 times negative 1, plus 1. Let me try it again. The 1 at the beginning, and there's a 1 at the end, 2. I'm going to get 2 plus 2 or 2 minus 2 inside that square root. 2 plus 2 is 4, the square root of 4. 2, a doubling of amplitude. That's part of the comb filtering story. And 2 minus 2 is 0. The square root of 0 is 0. Total cancellation. So this ends up being, even though it looks like kind of annoying math, you can impress your friends, it ends up being that cosine pattern, but in it ends up just toggling back and forth between 2 and 0. It's a cosine wave rectified. So if we take the negative lobe of a cosine and take the absolute value of it, you get this. So the comb filter is actually a cosine function in frequency that's forced to always be positive, And it just goes back and forth between a doubling in amplitude and complete cancellation, which in dB land is plus 6 or negative infinity. So this, this tedious math gives you, if you were ever interested, and it's debatable why you ever would be, this math gives you a description of comb filtering that's quite robust and you can go calculate things. And so for this next graph, I say let the delay time difference between them be one millisecond. If the reflection arrives one millisecond later and the reflected signal is identical to the direct signal, then you're going to get a doubling of amplitude at 1K, 2K, 3K, 4K, 5K, 6K. You see why I chose one millisecond. And you get an absolute cancellation at all the 500s in between, 500, 1500, 2500, 3500. This isn't meant to be a proof of comb filtering. It's a quick review with a little bit more rigor, perhaps. And it's called a comb filter because in, free, in linear frequency, it looks like teeth of a comb. But if you're trying to learn to listen to it, you need to learn what that sounds like. Because our, our <coughs> excuse me, our consumption of the frequency axis is, is more logarithmic. Well. So one reflection, danger, potential for comb filtering. What happens if there are two reflections? If you, I, I'll spare you the details of the map, but if you go along for the ride, you're going to see that with two reflections, it ends up looking familiar. Recall that the term inside the square root was 1 plus a gain factor plus a cosine term built on the delay difference. If you have two <coughs> repetitions of the signal, then I'm going to let g1 equal 
be equal to the relative level of the first reflection compared to the direct, and G2 is the relative level of the second reflection compared to the direct. D1 is how much later the first reflection is. D2 is how much later the second reflection is. And if I do that, I can stack up the terms and see that the equations look very similar. But I've done something that Mr. Friesen wouldn't allow us. This isn't divide or anything. I'm literally stacking up like terms. This equation for the magnitude of the frequency response with two reflections really looks like this. But I just want to gather like terms. And I want to say, hey, look, there's a 1 plus a bunch of gibberish. There's a G1 squared when it was one reflection. I got G1 squared plus G2 squared when it's two reflections. And there was a 2G cosine. I got two of those now. It's two gain of one and cosine based on delay one plus two times the gain of two cosine based on the delay difference between the direct and two. You okay with this? So you might think one Delay means one pattern of comb filtering, and two reflections might mean two combs overlaid. Not a bad theory, but it, it's wrong. It is true that when we have two reflections, I get two of these sort of terms stacked up here, even though it's all just addition. But I also get, so that, those look very similar to me. Two sort of patterns of combs. But there's this other term. And this term is a cosine driven on the driven by the delay time difference between the two delays. So if I have a direct signal that I hear followed by a delayed version followed by a second delayed version, you get comb filtering between the direct and one reflection. You get a pattern of comb filtering between the direct and the second reflection. And you get a pattern of comb filtering between the two reflections, which makes sense. So this extra term shows the complexity that builds up. The, the actual math is it's two times each of the two g's times a cosine built on the delayed difference of those arrivals. And if you do it for six reflections, let's say that you're in a room and you get a single floor bounce, a single ceiling bounce, left wall, right wall, rear wall, front wall. Of course, the world's more complicated than that. But with just six reflections, check out how messy it becomes quickly. We get, and this is addition, by the way. It's 1 plus g1 squared plus g2 squared plus g3 squared. So it's the sum of all those gain terms squared, which is the relative amplitude of each of the six reflections compared to the direct signal. And we get the accumulation of all these individual cosine terms. That all looks kind of familiar. It seems like six reflections is six Comey filter patterns with peaks and valleys that would fall in different places. But the interaction among the delays mushrooms. It, it, it absolutely explodes because the permutations between all the pairs of reflections grows more complicated still. So if you, if you recognize that the real world is never going to be a single reflection, and you just if you <coughs> let the complexity grow to six reflections, even though any real space, you know you're going to get double bounces. It's not just a single reflection off each of the six partitions. And by the way, in this room, there are columns and chairs and steps and a very complicated ceiling of soffits and other things. So it's ridiculous to think that if, I, if you look at just the first order bounces off every surface that reaches your ear, they're more than six. And if you recognize that they're double bounces, it gets beyond six really fast. And the interesting thing is, I hope the comforting thing, is that you don't end up with more and more comb filtering as you introduce more and more delays. In fact, they sort of smooth out. So if, if this is based on a real... Uh, listening room, a living room that, that meets standards. There are standards that define you know, living rooms. It's hard to believe what people will standardize. But so if, I, if, if you listen to six reflections in, in the standardized living room, you end up with, while it's kind of messy, the frequency response grows smoother <coughs> as you recognize that there are more reflections in a real space. So sure, one delay should make you suspicious of comb filtering, and you should listen for it. But as you introduce six or more delays, and six isn't a magic number, as you introduce more and more delays, the comb filtering grows more and more obscure. Because it's not just six delays is six combs, it's six combs plus this ever-growing other complexity. And the coloration is absolutely potentially there depending on the delay time differences between them. But if they're fully randomized, then it would tend towards a flatter and flatter frequency response. So, to think of a room as a bunch of reflections and that leads to reverb is totally valid. And if you were scared of comb filtering, maybe you're not. Reverb is truly a whole bunch of delays, but that dense volley of reflections is so vast that it doesn't come out as crisp, strong coloration comb filtering.
There will be no more equations like that for the rest of the night, I promise. But did you, that was very quick sort of visual algebra. Do you feel like you followed that? No one really wants to slow me down there and make me do it again, but are there any questions that pop out from that quick discussion over there? Yes? Um, why is it always the one at the beginning and not, why does that not uh, keep adding up? Uh, well, it's... So why, why, so for every reflection, why is there not another one at the beginning? So you, you might think of one as being the direct signal. Oh, okay. So there's no more than one direct hit. And if I go back to the comb filtering, sort of related to that, another extreme, sometimes people focus on, uh, so what's going on here at zero hertz? Why is there a peak at zero hertz? What does that mean? Well, it's, it's, not, it's not particularly important for frequencies that we can hear, but if it's an unchanging frequency, zero hertz, it's DC. If it's acoustic DC, if it's just an increase in pressure, if you introduce a reflection, that increase in pressure doubles. So it does, this comb filter trend does go all the way down to zero hertz with a perfect 6 dB doubling at zero hertz. And don't freak out, the pattern continues in negative frequency also. But I'm not into that kind of music. <laughs> yeah, so these equations, uh, they might explain a lot of things that you already sort of suspect were there and that you can hear. So if reverb's a whole bunch of delays, how many delays do you need? I'm still wondering. Is there a comment? Yeah. Yes. It doesn't count with the short frequency because there is a delay, obvious. The delay, well, the frequency response does smooth generally. But if you're talking about fast impulse, you and a clear analysis in the end, it's good to detect that it's <coughs> nonlinear frequency response, much, much worse than this one. Or non flat. You mean non linear or non flat? Non flat. Non flat, yeah. So um, the. It, it, it's sort of unfair. There, there are more details than there's time to go into tonight, but I'm actually showing with the dash lines that that's the actual result of the, the, this particular pattern. So the bold line is the third octave smoothing that tries to be roughly consistent with critical bands, which is too smooth if you're designing a space, but it's, it's, it's the right amount of smoothing if you're trying to quickly assess maybe what is, is going to be problematic or not. Probably smoothing it at a twelfth of an octave or something like that would have been more realistic. But so unsmooth is the blue dash lines, but you see there are many peaks and valleys, but many of those peaks and valleys fall within the same frequency analysis bandwidth for human hearing. And so I, I, I would say that many of these notches and many of these peaks are not perceptible as notches and peaks anyway. And so I want to smooth it to get a line that sort of shows what's more consistent with how we might hear it. And so I'm taking liberties here for sure, but I've done one third octave smoothing to get that solid line. And I, I should just reopen MATLAB and maybe do it with one twelfth octave or something. And in a different talk, uh, if you want to talk about comb filtering, I can talk about comb filtering uh, just as an entire topic one evening with brownies and cookies on another day. I think comb filtering is pretty fascinating and very important from a music production point of view as well as a room design point of view. Yeah, so I did some smoothing there that I didn't explain. How many delays? Well, I don't know what you were doing in 1962. I wasn't. But Manfred Schroeder, the Beatles were singing Love, Love Me Do, and Manfred Schroeder was working at Bell Labs and thinking about this, and he had a supercomputer, which would have much less signal processing than your cell phone. But at the time, it was super. And he was thinking about artificial reverberation. And he recognized that a single delay, and so as to make it impressive, we now use delay time, not T, but tau, lowercase Greek letter tau. So with a single delay and recirculation, we could have a single impulse goes in, and what comes out are some repetitions of that. And wouldn't that be reverb-like? Manfred Schroeder thought to himself. So he tried it. He said, what if I have a single delay time with regeneration, so there's a scaling factor G, probably less than one, that takes the output of the delay, sends it back again at lower amplitude, it gets further delayed, some of that comes back out, further delayed, and so you end up with, if I play a perfect impulse, then I end up with some repetitions, that's gonna sort of reverberate. This is the build, a building block for digital reverb. It would be 
it depends on the, the scale of time. If this delay time is very small, it'll be a wash of energy, not a, a perceivable echo. So if it's below the echo threshold, somewhere around, if it's below 40 milliseconds, if it's below 30 milliseconds, in fact, if it's three milliseconds, then it's gonna sound to us like comb filtering, a resonant comb filter, those of you who are into that sort of synthesis. So the time scale is meant here to be very small, not repeating echoes, but a blurring of the signal over time. But for sure, it's a comb filter. Definitionally, it's a comb filter. And the only way he could do this was he had, to, he had to make his own converters and digitize audio. He had to figure out how to digitize audio, let it run overnight through this algorithm that he'd written, and then he'd come in the next day and listen to a snippet of audio and decide if he liked the reverb. And of course, he noticed that it sound, sounded like it had strong coloration, courtesy of a comb filter basically built on one delay time. Unfazed by that, it's still 62. The Beatles are still on that one song, Love, Love Me Do, and he says, I'm a signal processing person, and there are people in this room who are familiar with this, but he said, I can do things to make it flatter in frequency response. I'm gonna feed it forward with opposite polarity, and I'm gonna have a little comb filter with recirculation, I'm gonna scale the whole thing by this term, and I end up with this sort of impulse response, and if I do that, and I look at the frequency content over the whole time window that it lasts, it's actually flat in frequency response. I'm not proving this to you, but if you've done signal processing, you, this might look familiar. Th these images are directly from Manfred Schroeder's AES paper in 62. So it's called an all-pass filter in that all frequencies pass with equal amplitude, but they pop out at a different time. So it blurs things in time. It creates repetitions of a sort of your signal. It resonates, and it's only done with a single delay. That's pretty cool. So he listens to that and realizes, well, it's sort of reverb-like without as much coloration. So he does this. The first digital reverb that actually might sound useful, which you could build in Max MSP or MATLAB if you want to. He said, here's what I'm going to do. It's still, by the way, 62. What if I have four comb filters in parallel? They're set to different <laughs> delay times, each with their own unique gain factor. I'll tune those delay times so that those comb filters fall at frequencies that undo the, you know, the notches of one, try to undo the boosts of another, and so on. So I'll make it messy. I choose those delay times very carefully. Four comb filters in parallel, and then a couple of all-pass filters in series. And the result of this is that it's going to be seriously diffused in time. So with some comb filters and some all-pass filters, Manfred Schroeder's able to build the precursor to all these digital reverbs we've been using. In his case, six delay taps was enough to create a wash of energy that was reverb-like. And there's still plenty of room for creativity. You need to choose the delay time of each of those towels. There's six different delay times. And the, the selection of the delay time will, term and will influence strongly the coloration that this, this reverb introduces to your audio. But this is a building block. And this is the basis of TC reverbs and lexicon reverbs and Yamaha reverbs that don't say convolution on them. So we have small spaces are good acoustic reverbs for us. We have springs and plates, which resonate mechanically. And we can make digital algorithms resonate by these banks of all-pass filters and comb filters. And there's, they become very complicated very quickly. But that's what the TC and Lexicon reverbs essentially have been doing. They've been building on what Manfred Schroeder did in 1962. Manfred Schroeder, by the way, suggested using ref reflection phase gradients to achieve the diffusion that RPG, we're still rolling, right? That RPG charges a lot of money for. Uh, so Manfred Schroeder has been a very generous and clever person in our field. Uh, so he's the, he's, he's the father of a lot of things, reverb and diffusion uh, for room treatments. So that's non-convolution reverb. Let's look finally at convolution reverb. That's why, I think that's why we're here. Here's the idea of convolution reverb. Let's, let's have a slightly more complicated space. I have a space now capable of two reflections. It's again a sound source and a sound receiver. And if I play, this is my favorite song, it goes click, only it's shorter. If, if I have a perfect pure impulse, a clave might do, highly damped clave, uh, then what happens in this room might be a specific pattern of reflections. They arrive at a certain time after, and they're attenuated in the level because the sound has been spreading out as it propagates. 
So with propagation distance, it grows quieter still. So it arrives later and quieter. That's cool. So when the source is here and the receiver is here, there's this very specific pattern that would accompany every single click. And the response of the room to a click is called its impulse response. In this case, an idealized impulse response. If I play an impulse, here's what I will ultimately receive. It's a pattern of the impulse and delayed and attenuated. But it's the exact same pattern, right? Because it's the exact same room. So you get the exact same time of arrival and amplitude differences between them. Well, what happens in this same room if I play not this pulse in isolation, not this pulse in isolation, but what if I play both pulses at the time shown? If I play click, click, it triggers each pattern. And if you just line them up and add them up, you're doing convolution. Convolution is nothing more than just algebra. You're adding. But you have to keep track of the amplitude and when it happened. And one event can trigger events that might happen later. So you have to keep track of those and line them up with other events that happen later associated with other portions of the waveform. But this is the resulting waveform that you would get in this space, this idealized space. There's nothing ideal about it. This simplified space that only has two reflections. This is what you would receive at that receiving position if someone played this signal at that sound source. And it's just lining them up and adding them up. That's sample it. Sample by sample. Sample by sample. That's right. Sample by sample, adding up the corresponding amplitudes. That's all convolution is. Seriously. So here's a snare hit. And let me zoom in on the very front of the waveform so you can see it. This is pulse code modulation. Here's a sample. Sorry, here's a set of samples that describe a snare. And I'm telling you, it is a killer snare. I'm not going to play it for you. You just have to trust me. It's, it should have won a Grammy last night or the night before. And you can tell it's a close mic on the top of a snare because it begins with negative. It begins with a rarefaction. Most snare drummers hit the snare, causing the snare head to go down, causing a decrease in pressure that cycles in a complicated way. So we've zoomed in on the very first portion of the waveform. We have a sample rate that's converting the continuous amplitude into a series of pulses. Let's use these series of pulses to drive a convolution algorithm. So let's make it more realistic than what we had before, which was two click clicks. Here's an actual pattern of clicks that we know describes a killer snare. And let's use a more realistic impulse response. Instead of a room with two reflections, let's have a slightly more believable impulse response. Doesn't that look realistic? I mean, it's all hand drawn in PowerPoint on the train, but you get the idea. We're trying to make it more realistic. In fact, it's still a grotesque oversimplification. Any impulse response is going to have many more pulses than that. But let's see if we can apply this impulse response instead of that silly impulse response to that snare waveform. OK. So here's the original snare waveform. Those of you who are keeping track have noticed that I did some sample rate reduction because there are way too many pulses. I'm trying to make it more realistic, and I keep chickening out. So I deleted some of the samples so that we could actually see what's going on. So this is straight up pulse code modulation. This is what your A to D converters do unless you're, in, unless you're for some reason doing DSD. So you have a stream of pulses that describe the amplitude of the snare drum waveform over time. And I'd like to grab that single pulse. Of all of them, we'll do it to all of them, but let's look at this single data point at that. It's my favorite part of the song right there. And to that, we will apply, I think we've lost a color. Hmm. We apply the impulse response, which I don't see anywhere. But that impulse response applied to that pulse triggers the red thing that you can just barely make out. Right? So it's the original impulse response, but it gets scaled by, it gets scaled by the amplitude of the snare waveform at that moment. So now it's maybe, it's not just two simple impulses, two simple elements in the impulse response. It's a more complicated situation. And for the negative portion of the waveform, and for the negative portion of the waveform, there we go. Let's take a look at this one element of the snare. Apply the impulse response to that. Boom. So it, the polarity flips, but it's the exact same pattern. You scale it, and you, and you line them up in time. So far, so good. So if we do that for every single one of these, 
PowerPoint's going to try to do that. It's going to grab every pulse of the snare wave. It's going now. It's hard to see. And it's, it's applying that impulse response to all of them. This is for a tiny snippet of a waveform. And for each snippet of the waveform, for each sample within this snippet of the waveform, we trigger an associated pattern known as the impulse response. They get bigger as the, as the pulse code gets higher in amplitude. They get smaller when the snare drum gets, waveform gets smaller. I think it's still going, by the way. When it goes negative, the snare drum goes negative, it triggers a mirror image in the amplitude domain on the y-axis, a mirror image impulse response. So you get negative numbers and positive numbers just as you get negative voltages and positive voltages on a mixer or increases in pressure or decreases in air pressure when, uh, when the waveform is acoustic. If we could keep track of all those individual elements associated with the triggering of all these impulse responses from the original snare waveform, if we could keep track of all that and add it up, we would have done convolution. Well, the math, though simple, it's just algebra. The, the scale of the math is daunting, or once upon a time was daunting. Let's consider a sample rate of 44.1. Do you remember that? I know it's really low fi Well, it kicks MP3s in the shins, but let's consider not compressed audio, straight up pulse code modulation. A sample rate of 44.1 means if our reverb time is about two seconds, which it is in the Music of Ryan's Hall at mid-frequencies, and the Concert Cabot at mid-frequencies, and Symphony Hall in Boston at mid-frequencies, is really close to two seconds, a little under in Boston. So let me round it up to two seconds and say, well, if the reverb time is two seconds long, that means the impulse response is two seconds long. So that means that it has two times 44.1. There are 88,200 pulses in the impulse response. And just to be clear, I didn't draw 88,200. Uh, life is way too short, isn't it? To draw 88,200 pulses in that pattern of decay. So what I did before had about 24 of them. But in fact, for a two second RT, which is you know, representative of the order of magnitude for reverb time that you would expect in a symphony hall that's flattering for romantic orchestral music, a two second RT needs 88,200 pulses in its impulse response. If I apply that to just one second of audio, which itself has 44,100 samples, then the math requires me to keep track of about four billion different numbers. Just line them up in the correct time frame and add them up to the other numbers that fell in that time frame. One second of music, mono music, one second of mono music at a sample rate of 44.1 involved with a two second RT triggers a, almost four billion samples that have to be dealt with. So the algebra is very simple, but what we ask of the computer is actually fairly challenging. And so basically convolution as, as a theory has existed from a time well before computers could do it. But roughly when the Apple G5 came out, that's when we, lucky to be alive in audio, were able to buy off the shelf a computer that had the chutzpah to do this kind of math. Okay. The FFT convolution is the reason why we can, I mean, that plus the Apple G5, that plus the raw Plux cover. But okay. if we had just the raw Plux cover, we could not do that in real time. We'd have, so the, the, the thing I'm not going to admit to is that we do this in the frequency domain, not the time domain. But time domain is a little bit more the orientation of recording engineers. Sure. I'm not saying so, that. That's, yeah. that's not a bad way to look at it. I'm, you're, I'm just saying that the Apple G5 doing this in the time domain with peanuts pants, <laughs> if, it, if it saw that problem. It, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I do understand what you're saying. It would be orders of magnitude more than it could have. Without doing fast Fourier transforms right. and applying it right. in the frequency. That's the only point. That was the only, that's cool. the only thing I wanted to Good. Thank you. If we let it be, well, before we go stereo, if we go to a slightly higher res, 96K, two seconds of RT, the, look how, I mean, the numbers get big fast. Now it's approaching 20 billion numbers that would have to be kept track of if we did it in the time frame. And make it stereo and you gotta double all those numbers. I mean, the, the, the impulse response you need, if, you're, if you wanna get the sound of Symphony Hall at your favorite seat in Symphony Hall, it's not one impulse response of a single microphone in that seat. It's a pair of microphones around your piece of Gouda, your, your head, your ears. You have 
stereo impulse responses that you would want to collect and apply to the music. So it, it approaches now 40 billion. And this is lost meaning, but before the big crash, you could just put it in order of magnitude in 2005. It's a really, really, really big number. And it's one second of audio, and it's only a two second RT. The new agers among you are known to use 30 second RTs. Right, and just, and just you know, you know, I don't know of any personal computer that can do 36 billion, billion. operations <laughs> per second. That's right. That's why it, it, it's not just a matter of having fast enough uh, <coughs> uh, brute force. Right, right. Because that's still too much. That, Bigger that, than even today. Right. Bigger than even today. Unless you do a trick. So one way to think of convolution is that you recognize that pulse code modulation turns your audio into a series of pulses of unique amplitude. And you let each of those pulses trigger the associated impulse response for the reverberant space you care about. And that impulse response gets scaled by the height and polarity of each of the individual component pulses that describe your audio waveform. If you can keep track of all the resulting numbers, their amplitude and their polarity, you know, negatives subtract from positives and so on. And most importantly, keep track of the time at which each detailed element of the pulse finally happens. If you can do all that and then just perform the addition necessary, you're doing convolution. That's all there is to that word convolution. And then with advanced signal processing, we can appreciate that we wouldn't do it in the time domain, we do it in the frequency domain and other things like that. Which I think is, a, for some of us, a little too abstract in, in the heat of recording session. So that's the idea, the definition of convolution. So what are the constraints on that system? I mean, if I were you, I might be suspicious. Is convolution really true? We didn't prove the math, I just gave you a peek into the math. But here's, here's what you might say we've claimed, and people much smarter than I have claimed this. For any input signal that varies over time, if I can have a system with some impulse response, which is, we're gonna use H of T for impulse response. If I know the impulse response, I can apply any signal to that impulse response and figure out what signal would come out. That's the claim. Turns out it's not globally true, but that's the idea. If, if anything could be described by its impulse response, a room seems like a nice space that could be defined by an impulse response. But maybe you're wondering, couldn't a, couldn't a compressor be described by its impulse response? Or an equalizer? Or a simple delay line? Could the space station set up to your favorite preset be defined by its impulse response? I mean, the claim is that any output can be calculated from any input if you convolve it, asterisk means convolve it, with the impulse response. You know it's impulse response. You can take any guitar track, any vocal track, and it never plays in Symphony Hall, but you can create the sound that it might have had in Symphony Hall if you got the impulse response for Symphony Hall. Might That's have the claim. Or would have had. Sorry? Might have had or, or would have had. Excuse me. Yeah, so I hedged in a suspicious way. Uh, would have had okay. if we do enough right. Yeah. yeah, keep me honest. It's good. So we don't have to play the vocal in Symphony Hall, but if we have an impulse response that is descriptive of what Symphony Hall sounds like for a certain source location and a certain receiver location in that hall, then convolution can fabricate for us, for our loudspeakers, the sound of that vocal as if it had been in Symphony Hall, even though we just recorded it essentially anechoic with a close mic and no added reverberance. That's, that's a major claim, and it has some caveats. The two that we're going to care most about is that it's not true unless the system is linear and the system is time invariant. And if you start studying signal processing, you'll study LTI systems, linear time invariant systems, a lot. And there are other constraints that you'll study a lot. So it's worth using the terms you'll see in signal processing books and understanding what constraints that might put on us. Because in the end, it's possible that convolution doesn't apply to a tube amp or to a compressor, but does in fact apply to a reverberant space, perhaps. So let's understand these two major constraints, that any system can be described by an impulse response which could be convolved with any source signal we might have in our studio, and we can create the sound of our signal. We can create the sound of our signal as if it had gone through that device or that room.
That's true if that device, that room, that thing is linear and time invariant. Alex, uh, that slide you had up before, what, well before with the two colors that you were worried about uh, colorblind? But the, yes. That is actually the proof to what you just said, the K caveats. You actually yes. proved it before you said it. So maybe you can tie back to this. Well, later, but, but that, that other slide proves to a signal processing guru, it proves it, yeah. Well, that's all you did in that other slide. You said, well, suppose we can add these two signals. And then you said, oh, suppose that the impulse, if I delay at one sample, it's the same pattern, but delayed. Right. One that, that's the time invariant caveat. Right. And the, so you suppose, well, suppose I can add the result from the one sample and add it to the other sample. That's exactly what linear is. Exactly. We can also do it with Simon and Garfunkel. <laughs> the, one of two claims for linearity. This is probably the most important one. What does it mean when a system's linear? I mean, you, you, if, you've, if you studied physics, maybe you studied a pendulum and a spring with a mass and no friction. Did you ever have to do that stuff? So if you studied springs, you were aware of a spring constant, that the force that the spring pushes back with is directly proportional to how much you squeeze the spring. When the spring is linear, it can be explained by a fixed constant. And it is the springiness of air that causes a sound wave to propagate. I can create a disturbance here, me and my sound producing system, and it is sure to reach your ears because any jiggling of the springs in air that I create here makes its way out to you because of the springiness of air. And if the springiness of air follows a linear spring constant, then it's going to be a linear system. So you might ask the question, is air linear? If you don't compress or uncompress it by too much, it behaves like a linear spring. Well, springs, you know, if you, have, if you have a slinky and a big brother, you know what happens when you overstretch the slinky, right? So a slinky's a perfectly good time until someone overdoes the slinky. A spring is perfectly linear and well-behaved, but if you pull it too far, it becomes nonlinear. The spring constant changes. Maybe the metal yields a little bit. Something changes. Air will also become nonlinear if overdriven. Basically, as long as your sound pressure levels are south of 130 dB SPL approximately, then you're within the linear springiness area of air. But air can be pushed harder still to where its opposing force is greater than a simple constant times how much you compressed it or rarefied it. And air certainly becomes nonlinear in the throat of, the horn, of a horn, a horn loudspeaker or a trombone. Poor air in a trombone, wouldn't that suck? Um, air becomes nonlinear in a jet engine. So, and, and nothing magic and terrifying happens when air becomes nonlinear, except that convolution no longer applies. I mean, sound still happens, it just, it starts to clip. You've heard air become nonlinear if you listen to jet engines at a safe distance. Um, and, and some composers are into this. I mean, when, when Mahler fills the stage with 100 voices and 100 players and says, triple forte, everybody go, you can exceed 130 dB SPL easily in the hall at your seat. And part of what you're tripping out to is, man, the air's gone nonlinear. This is cool. I don't know what's going on. It becomes, <laughs> it becomes very sensory. You, you basically get harmonic and inharmonic distortion. So, so convolution will not apply if, you're, if your combined signals risk exceeding about 130 dB of sound pressure level. So Are you sure about that one? Yeah, I, I don't agree with that. Either. It's probably lower. Well, I mean, if you, uh, a Mahler symphony get it to 130 dB, I don't know. I, and I disagree that 130 dB, dB makes the air nonlinear. When do you think it becomes nonlinear? Oh, a hell of a lot more than 130 dB. 130 dB. 174 is one, oh. one atmosphere RMS. Okay, yeah. Okay, I can believe that. Yeah, that but there's a lot of dBs between 174 and 170. Uh, to be continued. <laughs> <laughs> The, the sound pressure deviation has to be a lot less than one atmosphere. And 130 dB is still a lot I thought less. you were saying it has to be more than an atmosphere. No. About that, it, it has to be around an atmosphere. It's not symmetric because it has below, below vacuum. Right. And below that, it's already not linear. Right? Sure. <laughs> At extreme sound pressure levels or not, Air becomes a, something of a nonlinear spring that becomes noticeable. So if 
The idea of linearity, if linearity were true, then the following would be true. It would be that, separate from reverb, that you could record Paul Simon alone, record Art Garfunkel on a stool next to it in the same room, different mic, and if you mix these two signals together in the mixer, you'll get the same result as if they'd sung together in the same room at the same time. If that's true, and that's for the most part true, then the system is linear. If the two individually are the same as the two combined, then it's linear. And basically, as long as the two individual sound pressure waveforms don't become nonlinear, or their sum doesn't become nonlinear, then convolution's going to apply to that system. Well, and, and they will exceed 174 dB SPL because Art Garfunkel supported the Vietnam War and Paul Simon didn't. <laughs> so in fact, this is how we have to track them today. This is, this is in fact politically <coughs> impossible. The same is true for John and Paul and a few other grumpy couples. That's the idea of linearity. The idea of time invariance says that the impulse response doesn't change over time. It doesn't really make sense to apply an impulse response to our music if that impulse response is not indicative of how that room behaves all the time. So we need, we need an impulse response that doesn't change over time. If the impulse response now is the same as it was a second ago or a minute ago or a day ago or a year ago, then the system is time invariant. Yes? Well, both. It, wherever it exceeds that sound pressure level where the springiness of air is nonlinear, whether it's at the trombone or at your ear, if it's nonlinear in either location. The trombone sounds different. Than part of the sound of brass is definitely, part of the sound of a clipped horn is that, of any horn, is the, is. <laughs> Yeah, right. Have you heard the crackling associated with jet engines? Even you can hear it on a TV recording of a of a of a shuttle taking off. That crackling is the sound that the air can't go. It, it's basically hard clipping on the negative excursion side because the air can't go lower than you know zero. Well, it can. It can. It can cavitate, but that gets messy too. That's what the crackling is. It's good, if, if you're not listening carefully to rockets, you're in the wrong field. You gotta listen to rockets, not just snare drums, but also the reason to go see the shuttle takeoff is to listen at a safe distance. And think of it as a texture that you can work into your next composition or your next mix. So for things that are linear and time invariant, then convolution's going to apply. So, Real spaces are pretty much linear. There's some, there's some debate about this in the, in the front right of the room, which I, I totally welcome, but don't want to don't wanna stop this presentation, but it's a, it's a rich topic for further conversation. But in, it, in my research, I find that real spaces are pretty much linear. We're not overdriving the air so much that convolution as an idea doesn't apply. And there's an industry of convolution reverbs that counts on that. Maybe air's becoming slightly nonlinear sooner, I haven't seen it, but I respect the people it's who are the suggesting this. We think that it's much like, higher. Right, right. We just think that you've got to go a hell of a lot more than 130 dBs to make things go. Oh, good. Well, that's comforting. That's, that's <laughs> Real spaces are pretty much linear unless you're really cranking it somewhere north of 130 or 170 dB SPL. Just to be clear, hearing damage is a risk closer to 90 dB SPL at some frequencies. So if you're in a sound field that's greater than 130 dB SPL, your ears are gonna tickle or they're gonna hurt. They're definitely gonna ring the next day, wear a Van Halen concert t-shirt the next day. It's probably unhealthy if it's 130 dB SPL or more. Uh, and just a criteria, typically an ambulance siren. Yeah. I didn't mean to suggest all Mahler, by the way. And even if I was stone cold deaf, I wouldn't 
ACLs that are like what happened with bombs happen, or space shuttles or whatever. Yeah. Would you want to be in the, within 100 so feet of the space shuttle stuff. taking off? I mean, it'd be, it'd be, you know, even if they're without any blast or what, blast, yes, <laughs> but without any heat, it'd be pretty scary. It would be scary. Goggles and earplugs alone yeah. wouldn't be enough. <laughs> yeah. Done. But on the other hand, you're saying if this happens at the source, it doesn't matter where you are, you'll still be able to recognize it. Well, so if, I mean, um, if, if, if I measure the impulse response of a room, let's 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 try to use convolution to simulate reverb in Boston Symphony Hall. <coughs> if if I create a sound source in Boston Symphony Hall, I need a sound pressure level that doesn't live in the nonlinear range of air when I do that test. And if I'm going to send any signals through my convolver, they need to happen at a level that would not have overdriven the hall. Otherwise, what comes out of the convolution engine, while reverberant and interesting, will no longer be te technically the same, theoretically the same, as what would have happened in that how, hall. How are you measuring that? With loudspeakers and a microphone, or with a gunshot and a microphone? Because yes. I'd say that the, your worry is the loudspeakers, not the hall. And we'll, and we'll talk about that. So how do you measure an impulse response? It turns out to be very frustratingly difficult. And, 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 the, and the major challenge is the sound source, not the sound receiver. The Danes have got us some great microphones, and so does Earthworks. So we can, the microphone portion of it isn't too difficult, but creating the sound source that energizes the hall so that we can capture its impulse response is usually the challenge. We pop balloons, we shoot guns, we have loudspeakers that play special test signals, and a lot of software that tries to overcome that. But what I'm saying is that's, that sound wave, the amplitude of that test signal, needs to be in the linear range of air or the convolution that results becomes more and more a work of fiction rather than what actually happens in Symphony Hall. But if you think of it from a production point of view, what I'm saying is, so if you're still sort of wondering, well, wait a second, in the mouthpiece of the trombone or somewhere in the sick plumbing of a trombone, has the air gone nonlinear? Yes. But you could say, who cares? You could say, I'm going to record the trombone in a studio and it, it maybe isn't good technique, but let's imagine I record it with a U47 three feet away from the trombone. If the signal that the microphone picks up is well within the linear range of air, and that's what I record on the multi-track, and that's what I send into my convolution reverb, I'm okay. The signal I capture of the trombone is gonna be full of the crackle and weirdnesses of what was nonlinear within the plumbing of the instrument, but the signal itself from three feet away can be the input into my reverb if that is at a sound pressure level that's low enough not to be in the nonlinear range of the air. So ultimately what I care about, and part of why I'm trying to call the talk convolution for recording engineers, is that I'm interested in knowing what I can do in a multi-track recording studio with convolution. And I'm going to have a multi-track full of sound sources that I recorded in recording sessions, maybe close mic'd in a studio. And as long as I'm living south, in my opinion, living south of 130 dB SPL, I'm well within the range where the, where the system is linear so that the convolution reverb that results is not a work of fiction, but it's actually, at least theoretically, a replication of what would have happened You're in that space. Well that's, does that sort of make sense? So if the instrument itself became nonlinear within the instrument, but the signal I collected takes all those distortions and nonlinearities and, and captures it at a level well south of 130, 120 dB SPL, then it's a valid signal to feed to my convolution reverb. So although the... Don Palus has recorded a few brass instruments in his day, in case you don't know well, this. What I was going to say, though, is as interesting as the discussion was for the last 20 minutes without exceeding that, <laughs> I think that's right, for the most part. But I think it's worth being aware of. But if, if you know that a metal spring, when over squeezed, becomes nonlinear, air also could become nonlinear. And we're, we have to know that it, linearity of air is necessary for all that addition to have any physical meaning. But yes, in the heat of, of, sorry, in the real world for most recording sessions, 
we live south of that. But you know, at a drum, in a brass instrument, there are many things where, where air has become nonlinear. So unless you stick your mic where it's happening, you're not going to run into that? I think that's a fair net summary of that, yeah. And don't stick the mic into the trombone. Don't even it's stick your roommate's mic into the bell of a trombone. Trombone may be one of the loudest instruments you're likely to record. Yeah. Um, when you're collecting the convolutions, now are you collecting an average? Because like certain like a snare drum or something with a strong transient. Yeah. Does that have, you know, that in symphony hall? That is that going to have a different convolution than something else? Is that going to create a different pattern than something with a slower transient? I think we'll get to that into into some earlier slides. And so when you say collect the convolution, I think what you mean is collect the impulse response. Yes. If I'm trying to measure the impulse response of a space or of a thing, how I measure it isn't trivial. And you may think you could measure it with a snare hit or a hand clap or a gunshot using blanks, by the way. Write that down, use blanks. <laughs> um, those are all valid starting points for how to energize a space with a really short waveform. And then when you measure what results, it gives you something approaching the impulse response. But there are much cleverer ways to do it also. And so I think we'll have time to talk about that. So somewhere between 120 and 174 dB SPL, we could say spaces are linear. What about time invariant? Well, spaces aren't exactly time invariant. You might think at first look that the pattern of impulse responses in Symphony Hall wouldn't change unless the walls or the ceiling moved. And they essentially don't. I mean, they put in some windows. So actually, it is as if the walls are different this year than they were last year. So the fine detail of the pattern of reflections in the impulse re response of Boston Symphony Hall. If you already have some, they're all null and void. The hall sounds different today. But that doesn't happen very often, that they change the construction of a wall or a ceiling. So if the walls aren't moving and the ceiling isn't moving, would the impulse response change? Would the pattern, would the time of arrival or the amplitude of those individual pulses, which represent all the reflected energy coming back to a listening location based on energizing with the pure impulse, would that pattern change over time? Is the hall the same today as when it opened in 1900? Well, it is true that with the exception of a few halls, the walls and floor and ceiling don't move. That turns out to be fairly expensive and a little scary. So we don't tend to move walls and ceilings and such. But if the air moves, that will change the impulse response. The speed of the waveform is the speed of sound in air plus the speed of the air. So if the air is moving, the air is moving towards you, the speed of sound is slightly, sorry, the speed of propagation of that wave is slightly faster than if the air were moving away from you. Now it's very slight changes that probably don't matter, but a real space, a large space, isn't purely time invariant because, because 2,000 people walk in, sit down in the hall, and you're all a bunch of space heaters, no offense, and so you create heat, the air expands, becomes less dense, it rises, they fight back with air conditioning, cool air falls, so the air is moving, it's coming and going in inconsistent ways that vary in the course of time during the concert. Therefore, the impulse response changes ever so slightly. So maybe you could make the argument, if you're really paranoid, you could make the argument that spaces aren't exactly time invariant because of the heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, convections, and thermals, and things that might move the air. There's been no research that shows if that's perceptible or not. And most of us suspect it's completely imperceptible. But maybe you could conclude Maybe you could conclude that the convolution of a, of a de highly desired space is a little bit more static than when you really listen to 40 minutes of music in a space. Right. Also, if the modern work is after the intermission, the reverb time of the hall is going to go away. Can you explain why? Because everybody goes home. Every Yeah, so, so the reverb time does change as people run away. Oh, the composer's alive? I'm out of here. No, they, they put so, it before the intermission, so that won't happen. Then, then they can play Brahms after. And the, there you go. Sounds like last week. Or, yeah, so, so the, the impulse response changes in a hall when the occup, occupied state of the hall changes. When people leave or when people move, or if people have beards one week and not the next week, that does change the impulse response very slightly. The point has been made, well, Aren't the seats in Boston Symphony Hall designed so that they're the same acoustically empty as occupied? That's not the case in Boston Symphony Hall, but it is a desired goal in this day and age to try to make seats that are similar, empty versus full. At Symphony Hall, it doesn't matter too much because we're able to sell that hall out a lot. But if you're a community orchestra in a small town, 
you might want seats that are more similar occupied versus unoccupied. They, they make the bottoms of these, instead of steel like this, they're, they're, they're soft. They're, they're perforated soft. metal, and so there's absorption. Yeah. So you try to, you're absorptive. You're not only space heaters, but you're sound absorptive. All we're of you. Diffusive. We're sound diffusive and sound absorptive. They should pay you. What are you doing, diffusing? <laughs> Other constraints to worry about. So we've gotten linear and time invariant, which is what you're going to see in the signal processing books related to convolution. But let's now push it more and more towards practical issues. Something you need to make sure you recognize is that no single impulse response is representative of the entire <clears throat> hall. You may be seduced by a marketing ad that says, this convolution has Boston Symphony Hall and Mechanics Hall in Worcester and all these other desirable spaces. But there's no single impulse response that describes Boston Symphony Hall. It depends on the location of the sound source. Did they do it from the conductor's podium, from the concert master's chair? Did they do it for some reason from the contrabassoon position? No contrabassoon humor allowed? <laughs> The, the simple identification of the instrument, contrabassoon, is hilarious <laughs> to me. It also, depends on the <laughs> it also depends on the location of the receiver. You're going to get a different pattern of impulses when you sit in the front row versus the second row versus the third row and so on. So the pattern of reflections depends on where you are, the receiver, and where the sound source was. And as has already been pointed out, the state of occupancy of the hall. I mean, so think about it. If I'm trying to say that there is an impulse response that I can always use to figure out the signal, I'm sorry about this font substitution, uh, input. <laughs> if I have, instead of some cello or contra bassoon on stage and me sitting in a seat, we might say, I'm going to measure the impulse response using a loudspeaker and a microphone. Well, the resulting impulse response would certainly change if you move the sound source and or the sound receiver. You get a different pattern of reflections. So for every sound source on stage and every seat in the hall, there is an impulse response. And they're different. You can tell they're different because one's blue and one's yellow. Is there a standard that people who are doing um, impulse responses are trying to use? There, Whether it's, you know, are they two thirds of the way back in the center of the hall? Or? Sort of. So the, there are standards which I'll point to for how you must measure the hall if you've built a hall and you would like to, and who wouldn't, you would like to publish the data that shows your hall is better than Boston Symphony Hall. If you're going to publish data competitive with those other halls, you need to follow a certain standard that defines a lot of things associated with your measurement equipment and your measurement technique that would get at that. But we're not so much interested in creating a, a measurement of the hall that's indicative of the, of the hall so that we can raise our ticket prices. We might be more interested in understanding what's the best impulse response that's going to be useful to me on my mix tonight. And so the result is when you, when you, in your convolution reverb, if you load in an impulse response, it's not enough to load in the one that says Boston Symphony Hall. You might want to know, is it two thirds of the way back or is it up front? Is it on a balcony, side balcony, rear balcony? Because you might have an opinion about what sounds best. What sounds best for this piece of music, for this track that you're putting it on? Because they're all valid. And so you might seek out the best seats in the house, whatever that means. Or you might seek out unusual seats in the house to help you create an interesting reverb patch for your didgeridoo. <laughs> so it is location specific, <coughs> location of sound source and sound receiver. And so let's just make sure we understand this. Here, here is the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam, a fun city for everyone in the music business. Looking at the rear of the hall, looking at the front of the hall. The seating capacity is approximately 2,000 for these three shoebox halls that we talk about. A little bit more, a little bit less. If we say that the orchestra has about 100 people and it's a chorus of about 100, so it's a big deal. It's a big production. Again, Mahler comes to mind. So if, it's a, if there's 200 possible sound source locations and 2,000 possible seats in the hall, that means there are 400,000 valid <coughs> impulse responses from any potential instrument location to any potential seat. And, and by the way, that's mono. If I recognize that every seat, I really need two impulse responses, left ear and right ear, then it's really 800,000 impulses def define the hall. Those are 800,000 impulses of, of interest because you could conceivably sit in one of those locations and hear an instrument from the appropriate location to trigger the pattern of impulses that you get. 
So there is no one impulse response for the Concertgebouw in Amsterdam. There are 800,000 valid impulse responses. And by the way, how many of you are thinking, well, I'm interested in putting, what would it sound like if my didgeridoo were up here in the corner and I was listening on stage? That's valid from a music production point of view, but it's not the way someone might think of it as a classical recording engineer. You might want to essentially put your snare drum up here and listen if you were hanging under the balcony where there are no seats. So in the end, there are an infinite number of impulse responses. There's no single impulse response that describes the hall, even if the hall is famous and well known for being flattering to certain styles of music. Before we had the technology to make seats that are closer to an occupied seat, and, and you can't change these halls, people will kill you if you change anything in the hall. So the seats can get refinished so that they're slightly more comfortable, but they're not acoustically identical to an occupied seat because no one knew when these halls were opening in the late 1800s. Uh, no one knew that that was particularly important or doable. So these seats empty sound very different than these seats occupy. So no single impulse response describes an entire hall. And then this is coming back a little bit more to what John Crivet is pointing out. It also depends on the measurement quality, the location of the measurements, sure, but also the equipment you use and the recording technique you use when you measure the impulse response. Or if you're buying impulse responses from others, it's a lot like buying a record album. You need to decide before you buy, trade, or swap, or creatively acquire that impulse response, and you need to make sure that it's worth a hoot. Did the person who measured the impulse response do it in a way that's going to sound good? The quality of the equipment and the techn recording technique used directly affect the quality of the resulting reverb, which is to say, if the equipment used to gather the impulse response has no low end, your resulting reverb will have no low end. If the equipment used to gather the impulse response was distorting, which is to say if it was going nonlinear, then the resulting convolution is not going to, it's going to be rich with distortion and other sources of amplitude fiction. So the quality of the equipment trickles through to the quality of the resulting reverb. The recording technique is also a big deal. I'll come back to that. So here's the standard. ISO standard 3382 describes how you should measure a hall if you're building a hall and you want to publish the reverb data. It's a good idea to follow that. And maybe we in the rock and roll world, in the pop world, maybe we can learn from this. Maybe this influences how we might gather impulse responses. I'm not sure. Some of the highlights that we should know as recording engineers is that the ISO standard specifies an omnidirectional loudspeaker for energizing the hall. Very few of us have an omnidirectional loudspeaker. They're, they're fairly difficult to approximate. So if you're going to go, if there's a cool stairwell, and there are a lot of cool stairwells in New England, if there's a stairwell and you want to gather, gather its impulse response, you might walk out there with a, with a keyboard amp that you can carry. It's not going to be omnidirectional. It's not going to adhere to the standard. But if you're measuring a hall, they recommend an omnidirectional source so it energizes all faces of the hall. And they recommend omnidirectional, they require omnidirectional microphones for gathering the reverb. The idea is pick up the sound from all directions, get the total sound of the hall. And the standard also specifies frequency response capabilities of the loudspeaker. Dynamic range is a big deal. A noisy measurement is going to lead to noisy uh, reverb. And, and so there are many ways around this that are a little bit beyond the scope of what we do today. But Typically, if you're going to measure with a loudspeaker, the loudspeaker is going to distort well before most loudspeakers, even in sound reinforcement world, most loudspeakers are, are starting to distort when you hit 120, 130 dB SPL. Many of them <laughs> distort sooner. And remember that if we, if, if we want the measurement to be valid from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, we need a loudspeaker capable of high sound pressure level from very low to very high. That's a profound challenge for most systems. So they start to distort much sooner than that. But if you pop a balloon or fire a gunshot, um, maybe you can create higher sound pressure level rather than using a humble loudspeaker. Or there are measurement techniques that use a swept sine wave, a maximum length sequence, or something like that. And it basically has to do, <coughs> don't blame me, it basically has to do a deconvolution to figure out what the impulse response is. So you can use any measurement signal if the software is savvy you can use other measurement signals that are easier on the loudspeaker, a swept sine wave instead of a pure impulse. An impulse asks the woofer to suddenly snap forward and suddenly snap back. 
infinitely fast without overshooting or ringing. It's fairly difficult. But a sine wave is easier for a loudspeaker to recreate without distortion. So there are some tricks that people have used. Not tricks. There's some clever signal processing and software that we can use to make energizing the hall not as simple as firing a gun and, get, and making better use of a loudspeaker. So all these things are, you can study these if you want to design halls. You'll learn all about these things. Maybe that influences how we gather impulse responses when we're trying to shoot the impulse response of a fire stare that we think would make a good reverb on our snare drum. Yes? If you wanted to take the loudspeaker out of the, prop, the equation of it, yeah. wouldn't you, I mean, it seems to me, I, I don't, I'm not a practicing acoustical engineer, I'm an electrical engineer, but it would seem to me the thing to do is to, you know, whatever microphone you're using, some, D, some expensive B and K that doesn't go nonlinear, um, wouldn't you put a, you would, you would, you would measure the, the impulse response between a microphone placed very close to the source and then the microphone placed at the desk at the, the R location. And those between those two microphones, you wouldn't use the signal applied to the loudspeaker at sure, all. Sure, right. Because you can't trust the loudspeaker. That's true. That, so that, that's valid. So you, you would basically do the deconvolution based on close versus far. And, right. and yes. in fact, what we do is we don't measure it at the loudspeaker, though, though that's a valid approach. We just, the laptop knows the signal it's going to send to the loudspeaker, so it doesn't have to measure the close signal. It knows what it is, and it sends a tame signal that's, that's well within the linear range of the loudspeaker. Well, that's, that's, that's different. It is I'm different, saying, yes. I, I, I'm not saying not to do that. Right, so the loudspeaker's part of it, but we're trying to live in a linear range of the loudspeaker. But if you don't want to, if you don't trust the loudspeaker, I'd say you drive it with whatever you got, you know, right. MLS or whatever, and you might get close to the loudspeaker where, you know, on the source location, you might get at the receiver location, and I'll say dual channel FFT, I don't care, but yep. you, you get it from two clean signals from clean transducers. Right. And loudspeakers aren't clean transducers. Not a loudspeaker. Right, so, uh, so the theory of that, I suppose, I guess the question is, what close placement is valid? How close to the loudspeaker you dare put your, your close mic But in? if you're using APOS, it's easy. Just close the window on the physical mic, and just switch it to the close microphone. But a loudspeaker big enough to do what you're asking for is going to be easy. But it's not on the direct. Right, so that's the challenge. I can't, I can't do an omnidirectional close mic placement. It's going to sound different depending on where you point it. That's right. All right. So, so I think there's some headaches associated. Seven on the floor pointing up. So, the quality of the reverb that comes out of the convolution engine is only as good as the impulse response that you're able to measure. So, I think we can have two philosophies. You can treat it like a location recording session. You can treat it, treat it like a classical session and you bring all the discipline and high quality equipment to that and you're in pursuit of accuracy. You want to try to accurately document, archive, the impulse response of this very fine hall that you're in. So you treat it the same way you try to faithfully document what the sound of that orchestra sounds like in a hall. It's like a classical recording gig. You bring your best equipment, you, you, you become a very learned recording engineer to figure out where to place the microphones to capture the right sound and so on. That's a valid philosophy for how you could measure impulse responses. You could also treat it a little bit more like recording a drum kit in a pop production where basically creative microphone techniques also reward you. It's a difficult to record situation. You bring intuition, you bring trial and error, you borrow from things other people have done, and you treat it like a rock session where you're just trying to create, create a sound that's flattering, not necessarily accurate. These are both valid approaches to how you capture the impulse response. And so you just need to recognize, if you're downloading the impulse response for Boston Symphony Hall, that's still nowhere near guaranteeing that you're going to get the sound you imagine hearing based on your experiences with Boston Symphony Hall for all the reasons that we've been listing. But this starts to open the door to the idea that convolution is, is going to be a source of creative signal processing, not just imitative archival uh, simulation of existing spaces. Creative micro microphone technique, and in the case of measuring, creative loudspeaker placements might give you impulse responses that you like, even though they don't faithfully document the sound of the building, the sound of the room, the sound of the stairwell.
Okay, so here's the running list we have going so far. Another challenge with convolution has been, and it's getting better, adjusting parameters. You're perhaps all familiar with a digital reverb not built on convolution that you load in a preset, it's close to what you want, and then you tweak the reverb time, you tweak the, tweak the base multiply, you introduce some pre-delay, you get to massage it until it's exactly what you want. And that's difficult to do with convolution. Convolution, really, if, if we're trying to correctly imitate an actual space, there, it doesn't make sense that you could do any sort of massaging of parameters. If you're thinking, wow, this, the Concertgebouw sounds really good on my lead vocal, I just wish the reverb time were a little shorter. Well, there's no such thing as the Concertgebouw with shorter reverb time. <laughs> it's the Concertgebouw. So it becomes a work of fiction if you want to do that. It doesn't mean you shouldn't, but in fact, the early convolution reverbs, all you could do is just hunt and peck. You just look for impulse responses, load them in. If you liked it, great, move on. If you sort of liked it, you had to still move on. When it was right, it would just totally convince you. The loudspeaker illusion would be really beautiful and convincing. You'd know that was the vocal sound you needed, and you'd move on to other elements of your mix. But if, you, if it were close and you were trying to modify it, convolution sort of interferes. Because really all you can do is find a similar impulse response, load it into the convolver, and see what results. Now, things have changed. There are now, we can now apply effects for most good convolution reverbs that you're likely to get today. They can, do, they can perform signal processing on the impulse response that feeds the convolver. So that's a perfectly nice idea. So you could imagine if you had an impulse response and you wanted a shorter reverb time, you could just amplitude modulate it so that it all tapered off sooner. That's a valid approach. Just recognize it's a work of fiction. It's no longer the Concertgebouw. It's just a reverb that maybe you like, maybe you don't like. So effects get applied to the impulse response, and maybe that leads to some ability to massage the reverb until you like it. But it is still true in this day and age that if you're, if you're not just using presets, if you're a tweaker when you're mixing, you're probably going to be frustrated by most convolution reverbs because they don't reward exploring and tweaking as much as the wholly fictitious digital reverbs in TC and lexicon reverbs with that network of comb filters and all-pass filters and other signal processing that lets them create fairly ornate algorithms and give you user parameters that you can adjust that do predictable things to the spectral quality, the denseness of the reverb reflections, and, and the pre-delay and other things like that. So, so it's, it is, it, in a lexicon reverb or a TC reverb that doesn't use convolution, when you shorten the reverb time, it changes parameters in those, remember there were feedback associated around those delays, it adjusts parameters so that the measured resonance of that system is shorter. In a convolution reverb, it has to shorten the actual impulse response. And it could truncate it, it could just delete some of them, but that would, probably wouldn't sound as good as if it did Basically, if you imagine a, if you did a fade out on the impulse response, you could turn it down as it fades and make it fade sooner and shorten the reverb time. But basically, for any of these con convolvers, if you, all of them have the ability to not engage the parameters, and they sound, they typically sound very different when those things are disengaged versus when they're engaged. As soon as you engage it, it starts to modify the impulse response, and that may lead to a less exciting, less convincing, less realistic reverb, which I don't mean to suggest that's bad. I'm all for, I still love spring and plate reverbs. They're wholly fictitious, they make no physical sense. But if they're flattering to the snare drum, I like it. If it makes the vocal sound more interesting as a texture, I like it. So the reasons not, we don't just simulate space with reverbs. We change timbre, we do other things with reverbs. And so if that's your goal, if your goal isn't a simulation of the concertgebouw in your vocal, but your goal is to change the tone, the timbre, the texture, to do other things to the vocal, or you're not obligated to make it be the concertgebouw, it just needs to sound like a large-ish hall, then you can engage signal processing onto the, imp the impulse response. But just recognize it may change the quality. Don't just listen to the reverb time change. I guess that would be my advice. When you adjust the parameter, you say, that reverb's good, I wish it were a little longer, so you goose it and it's longer, and you immediately say, wow, it just got longer, cool, Grammy, I'm gonna move on to the snare drum now. You should. In fact, listen very carefully to the quality of that longer reverb too. 
because it's not going to just be the same reverb only longer. It's going to be a different reverb because it had to do some trickery to lengthen the impulse response or shorten the impulse response. And some of these things are easier to change than others. So those are some constraints. Let's make the glass half full, and we'll, we'll be finishing very soon. So you might think that, well, convolution, if, as long as I understand the constraints and the limitations, convolution is my chance to not buy a TC reverb or a lexicon reverb, with my apologies to those of you who make your living making those things. Maybe convolution is your chance to book a studio, shoot impulse responses of all your favorite patches, and take them home. Maybe you're thinking that. It's your ticket to all the halls. You don't have to book Symphony Hall for about 10 grand a day and record your vocals there. You can just get the impulse response and then use it any time you want. So it's your chance to get the sound of all these halls and opera houses and cathedrals and famous echo chambers, all these famous acoustic spaces. If you can get the impulse responses and they're of good quality, measured in a way that's supportive of your production in locations that are consistent with how you might want them, then it is your ticket to all the halls. Convolution could be a way to not book the halls but is it a way to not buy the equipment? You might think, couldn't I just capture the impulse response of equipment I wish I had, but I can't, they don't make it anymore, or I can't afford it. Vintage gear, expensive gear, rare gear. Well, be careful, because a lot of these devices that you prefer to just shoot the impulse response of, a lot of them aren't linear or time invariant. So a, a solid state EQ, an actual solid state EQ might be linear and time invariant. But a tube EQ, tubes are by definition nonlinear. So you can't simulate using convolution alone the sound of a Pultec EQ. Sorry to say. And the, and the modeling plugins that have the picture of the faceplate of a Pultec aren't using convolution to get the sound of a Pultec. They're doing other things. And by the way, they're not actually getting the sound of a Pultec. But that's the topic for another day. So some devices are linear and time <laughs> invariant. Like the old AMS RMX reverb was a time invariant digital reverb. It was an early digital reverb, fairly simple algorithms, still very desirable today for if you're looking for that certain kind of, grainy's overly harsh, but certain kind of sound, then they're time invariant. And when not overdriven, they're linear. So you could shoot impulse responses for those old reverbs. That's a valid approach, a valid approach. But some reverbs are not time invariant. Lexicon 480L, Bank 11, Program 1, nonlinear large hall, is not, it is time variant. The delay taps within that algorithm are modulating over time. Any impulse response you shoot of the lexicon is a single data point that isn't going to be how that lexicon behaves seconds later in your tune. That's the secret. That's the last fault. That's why it sounds so good. That's why it sounds so very good. The problem is, is room are not room modes, but modes. Sure. And you have just that that uh, 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 shorter thing stuck on fixed delays and stuff. You're going to get modes. You'll get coloration. Yeah. And, and if you move the delay slightly around, it won't have enough time for that mode to show its ugly face. Right. And uh, um, that's, yeah. So they're not. But it means convolution is right out. We think it calls it mode stirring. Mode stirring. Yeah. I mean, it's basically feedback suppression, tamed a little. Yeah, so probably your favorite sounding digital reverbs that aren't convolution reverbs are time variant. Part of why they sound so beautiful and appealing is that the algorithm itself, that's, that's a resonant digital algorithm, has time variant elements to it. So no single impulse response would describe what that device is doing. It's convolution, if you, if you get the impulse response of that at a certain point in time, It'll sound reverberant with a similar reverb time. It will not sound as, as beautiful. It'll have more coloration. It'll sound less natural, sound more unnatural, and so on. As I mentioned, tubes are always nonlinear. Tape is nonlinear uh, at almost all levels. Distortion, if you're thinking, wow, I can't afford a tube screamer, I'll just shoot an impulse response. Here's Stevie Ray Vaughan's tube screamer. It says right here on eBay that it was Stevie's, so I'll just measure it and resell it. It's distortion. It is nonlinear by definition. An Convolution would not apply. Compressors are time variant and nonlinear, so I'm sorry to say you still have to go get all the compressors you want. But it's a good idea for capturing some spaces in some simple early digital gear. For sound design, convolution's really, really appealing. If, if, if you have to do dialogue replacement, you've always had the challenge that if, 
if you're recording Al Pacino in a taxi cab and then they want to replace it in the studio, you need to simulate the sound of a taxi cab when you mix the new overdubbed Al Pacino vocal from the studio. Well, if you shoot the impulse response of every location where you record, it might get you part of the way there towards converting a close mic hi-fi studio recording into the sound on that location on that day. So it's really appealing uh, if you're doing dialogue replacement uh, as, as a building block. Though many great sound designers know how to massage the parameters of a TC or a Lexicon or a Yamaha or Sony. I'm sorry to be so <laughs> ethnocentric. There are many other great manufacturers. I just can't think of any others. Uh, so many great engineers can massage the parameters of those reverbs to simulate the sound of any location. Convolution is just another tool that might be used for that. Convolution is also a great synthesis technique. You can convolve your signal, your vocal, your 12-string guitar with alternative spaces that may not at first seem logical. Pipes and tubes and water tanks and stairwells and chimneys and empty peanut butter jars. So it, it's just a, a source of creativity. If you can measure the impulse response of an empty Kleenex box, you could see what your vocal sounds like in an empty Kleenex box. You can also convolve a signal with non-space waveforms. Why not convolve your guitar with a snare hit? Or convolve your snare hit with the waveform of glass breaking or something. So it's a great synthesis technique. You can't always predict what it might sound like, but it's pretty mind opening and most of us find it pretty satisfying. You can convolve Mahler 9 with Beethoven 9. <laughs> and it will be two and a half hours long <laughs> and might sound interesting. So in the end, convolution, I, I think it's useful to know the theory and know some of the limits and constraints so that you can better leverage the opportunities. In the end, I think it's a different approach. New is probably overstating it because it's now been around and available to us for a long time. It's a different approach to signal processing that might help us duplicate real spaces, might help us duplicate some rack spaces of equipment. Uh, it's really fun for sound design and synthesis. But I don't think in the end it's a, a total replacement for the other kind of reverb. So you have permission from me to purchase lexicon reverbs and convolution reverbs. You need them both um, because neither one totally replaces the other. And uh, I just wanted to mention, because this is the first time it's happened, if, if this way of thinking and talking hasn't pissed you off too much, I do have a book called Sound Effects, and the publisher has just given me permission to give out a secret code number if you wanted to get 20% off, and the shameless commercial stuff will end shortly. If you enter FX017 and buy it at Focal Press, they'll give you 20% off, basically taking all the money right out of my pocket. <laughs> but since it's so little money to begin with, that might be of interest to you. Thanks very much.